My name is Andrea Bumstead and I am a member at Restore Temecula. If you are new, we want to welcome you and thank you for tuning in. We believe the church is not an event, but a family that you belong to. So we would love the opportunity to connect with you. If you want to learn more about our church or if we can help in any way, please visit our website at www.RestoreTemecula.com and click on contact. We also have a mobile app with resources, including our Sunday messages, information about upcoming events, and other ways to connect. You can download our app on the Apple or Android App Store. With all of that said, we hope you enjoy the message. Hey friends, I want to welcome you this morning from wherever you're tuning in. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, my name is Herrick and I'm one of the pastors of Restore Temecula. And uh, this morning we're going to continue in our series called Jesus Is, which we've been going through for a while now. We're getting to the very end of the Gospel of John, which has been a rich, beautiful exploration of Jesus, who he is, what he came to do, what it means for us, how it changes everything. And uh, today we are, we're kind of hitting like an important turning point in the book where Jesus is just about to go uh, to the cross. And so we're going to get to see what that's like for him and for his followers. It's a difficult moment, and uh, we're going to learn, I think, a lot today. So I hope you'll you'll join me. You'll uh, stick with me. I think there's much that God wants to do in and through um, this, this beautiful text of Scripture. So if you will, would you pray that God would open our hearts and our minds to what he wants to say this morning. Uh, Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you reveal yourself through your word and that you speak to us through your word. And um, thank you that you are far better than we know. That the picture that we get of you is of someone who is trustworthy, who's good, who's true, and who is everything that we need, uh, everything that we lack, everything that we long for. God, it's you are, you're the one that we need the most. It's so easy to forget you. It's so easy to put you to the side, kind of shelve you you are what we need most. And so I pray that during this time, you would reveal yourself to us. You would give us a fresh sense of who you are and that you would invite us to follow you more wholeheartedly with more passion and, uh, and resolve and perseverance. God, we love you. We thank you that you're with us, even though this has been a hard year. Uh, thank you that you're with us and that you don't give up and that you don't quit on us. Um, Father, and I, I want to ask that you would help us to take that next step with you, whatever that looks like for everybody that's tuning in, of trust and obedience. We love you and we thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I'm going to start this morning's message off by telling you a little bit about the Chronicles of Narnia. And if you haven't uh, read the books or seen the movies, uh, it's a really beautiful story. It's a story about a family, the Pevensies. Uh, they live in our world in the 1940s during World War II, and they end up getting... Uh, kind of stumbling into this magical world called Narnia. And in Narnia, there's this, this true king, his name is Aslan. And uh, he's a great lion, so this is a fantasy story. And along the way, these kids, they're just normal kids here in our world, they discover that in that world, they're actually kings and queens, which is amazing. They have this new identity they didn't even know about, they're royalty. And so they, they have all these adventures with Aslan, Aslan defeats uh, this evil queen, and he sets them, the four of them, on, a th on thrones. And so they rule and reign with him. This sounds familiar. Uh, C.S. Lewis, who wrote these, was pretty well steeped in the Bible story. So they get to rule with him, with, with peace, with justice. And, uh, and I want to tell you today about the second story of the Chronicles of Narnia, which is about C Prince Caspian. And if you haven't heard it or seen it, um, it's, it's a really interesting story. So Prince Caspian is the rightful ruler to the throne of his people, which are the Telmarines. And they're distinct from the Narnians. So they're in the same world, but they're distinct from the Narnian people. But when we meet Prince Caspian, he's actually fleeing for his life. Why? Uh, because his uncle, his uncle's name is Miraz, he wants to kill Caspian so he can take the throne for himself. Now, Caspian, when we meet him, he's, he's been kind of overthrown. He, he's under attack, and so he blows on this magical horn that calls for aid. And what he ends up doing is he ends up summon, summoning the Pevensies, who had, had come back into this world, the real, our world, and now they go back into the, the land of Narnia. So they return, they find Caspian, and they start planning to restore Caspian to his rightful rule as king after he's been usurped by his uncle. Now, 
Why do I start with this uh, story besides the fact that I obviously like movies and books and fantasy stories and so on? Um, there's actually a point to this. Uh, Caspian's way of life, everything that he knew, it, it kind of fell apart. He was betrayed and he was wronged by someone who was close to him. And that deep betrayal that he experienced it led to a crisis. And it wasn't just a crisis for him, for Caspian. It was actually a crisis also for those who were there and witnessed it. What do we do? It was a question. How do we make this right? So why do I say all this? I think it's because we sometimes face similar situations in our world today. Um, can you think of a time when someone you trusted hurt you? Maybe it's a boss or a coworker who took credit for something that you did. Uh, maybe it's a spouse who's broken promises that he or she made to you, or maybe even broken their vows. Maybe it's a parent who, who you feel has let you down in some way. Maybe it's someone you thought was with you, but they walked away. And possibly they did it with like very little regard for how that affected you. Maybe it's someone who is close to you, whose words and actions, they cut you deep, whether they're young or whether they're old. Can you think of a time when someone you trusted hurt you? How'd you handle it? What'd you do? How did it go? What was the end result? Did your reaction make things better or worse? And why? See, I think for many of us, I think when we feel hurt, we react in ways often, I'm speaking for myself as well, this is from experience, I think oftentimes we react in ways that make things worse. What do I mean? I think too often we, res we resort to things like attacking, controlling, blaming, gossiping, pride, power plays, withdrawing, and maybe not even necessarily, I'm not talking about um, situations where there's abuse, right? That, that would be wise and responsible to withdraw. I'm talking about withdrawing into self-pity. When we are wronged, we face all sorts of temptations. What's often missing in our response? Well, in today's scripture, we're going to find out what's, what's often missing is our, in our response when we are wronged by examining different responses to the greatest betrayal and ensuing crisis the world has ever seen. So if we really understand what this story out of John 18 is teaching us, I think that we may never be the same again. So I'm gonna invite you to dive in. John 18, we're gonna be looking at verses one to 14 today. Let's find out what the text says. All right, John 18, one to 14, here we go. Let me provide a little bit of context as we dive in. So Jesus has just finished uh, a time of instructing, of praying for, and administering to his disciples one last time before his looming death. Uh, around then, so they're in Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, it's, it's a buzz with, uh, with the kind of like holiday feeling. It's festive. Okay, there's, they're celebrating the Passover feast, which the best way I've heard it put is that it's sort of like the Jewish 4th of July but with a twist. It's sort of like we're celebrating the 4th of July here in the United States, but we are being occupied by some foreign power. So you can imagine it's, it's tense, right? The Romans would be on the lookout for any signs of, of rebellion or uprisings to quash it, essentially. And as we're about to see, if, if Peter had his way, uh, they would get that opportunity. That's all the backdrop for everything that's about to take place. So let's go ahead and dive in. John 18, starting with verse 1, says this. After Jesus had said these things, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas took a company of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees and came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Okay, here's a quote, helps explain what's going on. Since Jesus was well known to public officials, Judas's role was not primarily to identify Jesus. 
but to locate Jesus's entourage and to distinguish them from others who were likely encamped on the hillside. Because there's a bunch of people in Jerusalem for this big Passover feast. So they wanted, so Judas wanted to be able to point out here are his men. These are his friends. This is an incredible act of treachery. Judas led Jesus' captors to Gethsemane and exposed the band of Galileans with whom he had spent the last three years. So if you can imagine the disciples thinking, they were stabbed in the back by one of their own. Okay, this would have been crushing, infuriating, and it would have sparked a fire in, in my soul if I was there. It, it would probably be the kind of thing that puts your body into fight mode or flight mode. Let's keep going. Verse four, then Jesus, knowing everything that was about to happen to him, went out and said to them, who is it that you're seeking? Jesus of Nazareth, they answered, I am. It says he there in the CSB, in a lot of translations, that he is not there in the original Greek. I am, Jesus told them. Judas, who betrayed him again, said that earlier, <laughs> making a point very clear. Judas, who betrayed him, was also standing with them. When Jesus told them, I am, I am, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Jesus' own betrayer falls down at his feet. Verse 7, then he asked them again, who is it that you're seeking? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. I told you, I am, Jesus replied. So if you're looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill, and these men would be his disciples. This was to fulfill the words he had said earlier. I have not lost one of those you have given me. Jesus fulfilling his own words. Now, what's happening here? Jesus brilliantly gets the arresting party to admit that they're looking for him. Just him. Not once. They say it twice. So he diverts attention away from himself. And I'm sorry, he diverts attention away from the disciples so he can care and protect them. He gives himself up for them. Christ is their shield. Verse 10. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it out and struck the high priest servant and cut off his right ear. Okay, this servant's name was Malchus. This isn't a made-up story. This is real. This actually happened. Verse 11. At that, not that I think any of, any of this is made up, but it's just that he's talking about real people to make the point that this happened. This is historical. This is the, these are the details of an eyewitness account. Verse 11. At that, Jesus said to Peter, put your sword away. Am I not to drink the cup the Father has given me? Now, what happens? Jesus prevents a rebellion that could have had his disciples arrested, cut down, or even crucified with him. He protects them. And he reminds Peter, hey, this is what I'm here for. This cup that I'm about to drink, this suffering, this agony, this death that I'm going to experience, that's why I came. That's the Father's will for me. Verse 12, then the company of soldiers, the commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus and tied him up. And our, our Lord was treated like a criminal. He was tied up, bound. First they led him to Annas, since he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it would be better for one man to die for the people. So what's going on here? So Annas was the high priest, and Jewish law basically said that that office was for life. Now, Rome, I should say Annas was previously the high priest, and Jewish law treated that as an office for life. However, this is, this is Israel under Roman occupation. So Rome didn't like one person having too much power, so they rotated the high priests frequently. So Annas was still, therefore, highly influential among the Jewish people. And his five sons, they all eventually became high priests. But Annas was the power broker who was likely controlling things. So commentators on multiple commentaries that, are, commentaries that I read noted that this family was known for their greed, for their wealth and power. What's my point in saying all this? These were high priests, but they, they really were, they were false high priests. Priests offer sacrifices. And they offered up, and these priests, they offered up Jesus. 
without realizing that this was the Lamb of God sent to take away the sins of the people. They didn't realize that they were sending Jesus to his enthronement as king. Amazing stuff. They don't know what they're doing. They think they're protecting their status, their reputation from some threat. They view Jesus as a threat, but in reality, they're playing right into God's hands, into his plan. Amazing stuff. Now, there's so much that I cannot cover. And the more I read this, the more I studied this, the more I'm just like, this, this is a fascinating text that could be a series in and of itself. So I'm just going to focus on three things. Okay, in light of, of being wronged, I want to look at three things. One, what did Peter do? Two, what did Jesus do? And three, what must we do? What did Peter do? What did Jesus do? What must, what must we do? Let's go ahead and dive in. Number one, what did Peter do when he was wronged? Okay, so what did Peter do when he was wronged? Peter attacked. Why did he do that? So here's one scholar's take that I found to be pretty helpful. Quote, it's not hard to imagine why Peter might have reacted so brashly. Peter and the other disciples still failed to understand Jesus' teaching regarding a suffering Messiah. And Peter probably expected the armies of heaven to appear and to begin the final war. Instead, his clumsy thrust just cut off the right ear of Malchus, though some think he intended to do just this. And Jesus told him to put the sword back in its sheath. Jesus had embraced the, the, the divine will and wanted to complete his calling, uh, while Peter was unwittingly placing himself against God's will. So thinking he was helping, Peter was actually taking matters into his own hands. He devised his own plan. He, he leaned on his own wisdom and understanding. And what was the end result? Uh, Peter unwittingly resisted God's plan to save the world. In some ways, Peter was just as blind as the religious leaders and the Romans. He didn't understand who Jesus was. He didn't understand what Jesus came to do. He didn't understand how Jesus would do it. And he didn't understand, Peter didn't understand his own role in Jesus's plan to rescue the world. So he attacked. Jesus himself had to disarm Peter. Now imagine for a moment, what would have happened if Peter's plan had worked? No cross for Jesus. No salvation for you and me. No salvation for Peter. That sword that cut off Malchus's ear would have been pierced into Peter's own heart if his plan had worked out. Why do I say this? I think it's important to make a note of this, that sometimes the most loving thing that God can do is thwart our plans, our impulsive plans specifically. On the flip side, sometimes the worst thing that can happen to us is that God allows our impulsive and self willed plans to move forward. Don't let you on. Now, I love Peter because I can see myself in Peter. I have moments where I'm impulsive, where I try to help but make things worse. I've had many of those type of moments, and recently even. And then wonder, like, what happened? Maybe you can relate too. So what did Peter do? It's the first, first question I want to answer today. What did Peter do? He took matters into his own hands and unwittingly resisted God's plan. Peter took matters into his own hands and unwittingly resisted God's plans. Yikes. Okay, number two. It's going to get better. What did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? So much. First, as I already mentioned, he saved Peter from Peter. So that's the first thing. It's good news for us. If Jesus can stop and reverse the stupidity of Peter, then there's hope for us that he could do that for us no matter how sizable, significant that stupidity is. So that's good news. Uh, a second thing that Jesus did is that he revealed himself as God. Ego eimi, I am. What's translated as I am he is actually just I am. Why is that significant? Jesus has seven I am sayings in the Gospel of John. He's the light of the world. He's the good shepherd, so on and so forth. And that should 
essentially take the readers back to a very special, important moment in the history of God's people. Exodus 3.13. Real, real quick, I'll read it. Then Moses asked God, if I, this is Moses working with God to save God's people. God wanted to rescue and save God's people out of Egypt and out of slavery, and Moses was God's chosen deliverer. And so Moses and God are talking it out. And Exodus 3.13 says, Moses asked God, if I go to the Israelites, okay, to your people, and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what's his name? What, what do I tell them? Verse 14, God replied to Moses, I am who I am. That is what you're going to tell the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Jesus is I am. He's God. He's God. And, and what do people do in the Bible, typically, when they have encounters with the divine? They face plant. They fall forward. What do I mean? It, you see it over and over again. Uh, Ezekiel has an encounter with God. He goes down. Uh, down goes Zeke. Uh, Daniel has an encounter. I believe in Daniel's case, it was just an encounter with, with, with an angel. Uh, but it was a, an angel who had been in God's presence. And he goes down. He's out, cold. Uh, Saul, who later became Paul, has an encounter with the risen Jesus. He falls off his horse. He hits the ground. Uh, John, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, typically, when people have an encounter with the divine, they fall over or face plan. That just happens. They've, so these soldiers very likely got some glimpse, some revelation, some in, in experience or encounter of the power of Jesus, who he really is. Down they go. So what does that tell you about Jesus in this moment? He's being betrayed. He's being sold for silver on Judas's part. Everything looks like it's falling apart. It feels like chaos is breaking out. All hell is breaking loose, if you will. And yet, Jesus just says his name and people fall to their faces. Who's in control? Who's really in control? Amazing. Just want to throw this in here real quick because I thought this was, I really enjoyed this. Uh, there's a, a a scholar, his name is Herman Ritterboss, and he read these verses and compared them to the rest of Scripture, and he kind of brought out this other possible nuance. He said, these actions, okay, these people falling over, um, they convey the transcendent. This might be an eschatological picture, a picture of the, it kind of blows up what's actually happening, kind of giving us a window into big spiritual realities, end times realities. And what does that mean? The confrontation between Jesus and these soldiers and his betrayer may actually be a window, a picture of the confrontation between Jesus and the powers of darkness that came out against him. And Herman Ritterboss, he sees a parallel between this and some of the Psalms in which God triumphs over his enemies. Now, what does that make me think of? I talked a little bit about Chronicles of Narnia and Aslan, that great king. There's a point in one of the movies where uh, he's talking to the to the the white witch um, who had brought like a semi-permanent winter in to, to Narnia. And he, he's face to face with her, with his enemy. And she like questions him. And Aslan just growls, this loud, powerful, deep roar. And everybody just kind of like is stunned and taken aback. That's what I think of in this moment. Jesus and the powers of evil. It's not a contest. Jesus wins. Jesus wins. In this deep moment of personal betrayal, Jesus, when he's rejected by the world, he's rejected by the Roman world and the Jewish world. Jesus is in total control of the chaos swirling around him. So what does he do? He takes charge of his own arrest. He takes charge of his own arrest. It's incredible. Okay, before I get into that, I just want to be very clear. Jesus is not some emotionless robot. He, he allowed himself to feel all of the feelings in Gethsemane, to struggle with what all this meant. But he submitted his feelings and himself to the will of God. And John is now emphasizing that Jesus is resolute. It's, it's the cross or bust for him. 
So Jesus takes charge of his own arrest. He practically commands that the disciples be let go. His disciples are almost certainly freaked out and scared in the face of hundreds of armed soldiers. But Jesus is in control. He protects his disciples from being arrested and suffering the same fate. He is like a lamb led to the slaughter. But no one takes his life from him. He lays it down himself. He had the power over his enemies, but he gave it up for you and for me. There's disciples there in the in that immediate context, but we know that this is a bigger picture of how Jesus gave his life for ours. So what does Jesus do? Number two, he trusts God's plan. He takes charge of his own arrest in order to protect his followers and gives himself to save them. And his love is extraordinary. Uh, even when some of his followers, though, they, they don't see Jesus doing much of anything. And so they feel the need to jump in and act and do something. Jesus trusts God's plan. Okay, number three, what must we do then when, we're in, when we face similar situations, when we feel wronged? We must remember God's story and how he works. Jesus knew the story, and Peter seems to have forgotten it. Okay, for example, the, when I say the story, I mean the story of Scripture, the big one. Let me just give you an example. Uh, the Messiah, Jesus, had to suffer first in order to be lifted up in glory later. That's Isaiah 53. Peter didn't understand how God was going to work it out. So when we misunderstand God's plan, when we misunderstand his ways, we tend to act impulsively like Peter. Here's a way to think about it. I started the story with Prince Caspian, right? So Prince Caspian, the betrayed future king, was working out a plan with the Pevensies on how to reclaim his throne. Okay, and, and this is a kind of a heated discussion or debate on what to do. So they're going back and forth at this point. Uh, they're talking about either withdrawing into the safety of the bunker that they're in, or on the, on the other side, conversely, going out and attacking first. Kind of like a first strike. We're gonna get, they're outnumbered, so we're gonna go out, we're gonna get, uh, we're gonna get them while they're not expecting us so that we can overtake them. Those are the two things that they're discussing and debating. What's missing in their thinking? The third option, waiting on Aslan, their true creator and true king who's available and always knows what to do. So Lucy Pevensey is the youngest of the four. When young Lucy brings up Aslan and like, hey, we're forgetting something. What about Aslan, the true king, our creator, who's good? What, do we do? what about him? He's the one, remember, who defeated the white witch previously? Who defeated evil? What about him? He must know what he's doing in this case. So she says that. He, he must know what he's doing. You can trust him. Let's wait. The responses that she gets are astonishing and sobering. Peter says this, I think it's up to us now. I think we've waited for Aslan long enough. And here's the crazy part. If you watch the movie, at least, where are they standing when they're having this conversation? They're standing on the exact spot where Aslan gave up his life to free Narnia and defeat the queen's rule. Peter is blind to Aslan's work in ways, even as he's talking about him and in the most obvious place you could ever be in to remember that he knows what he's doing. And I'm convinced that many of our reactions to life, especially when we feel hurt, they go wrong too because we, like Peter, forget about Jesus and feel like it's up to us now. We take matters into our own hands and then we pay the price. So in, in, Pris, in Prince Caspian, Peter uh, gets his way and so they attack impulsively and a lot of lives are lost. It's a failed attack. It hurts a ton of people and it casts a shadow over Peter's life and leadership. Waiting on Aslan and, and trusting him to come through with a plan and a way through this was harder, no doubt about it. But it would have been so much better for everybody, including Peter. So it is with us when things go wrong, and when we feel hurts in our marriages, in our parenting, in our workplaces, in our neighborhood, in our family relationships, and on and on and on it goes. When we are wronged, we have to turn to Jesus and trust in his plan, his wisdom, and his ways. Here's the thing though, we're not gonna do that 
if we forget what Peter forgot. I'm talking about biblical Peter now. That Jesus is in control, which we see that in the story pretty clearly. But Peter missed it in the moment, and we miss it all the time. Jesus is in control, and he's able to bring good out of even the most hopeless situations. He has a plan and a way that ends in victory over sin, freedom, and joy for all who follow him. I'm going to read you a quote. I thought this was so helpful. This is from Gary Burge. He's a biblical commentator. He says this about these verses. God will accomplish his purposes, revealing his glory despite what is happening in the world. No human being can stop it. No person is capable of stifling the glory of God if God intends for that glory to be shown. God is in control of history, even this hostile, seemingly darkened chapter of history that offers little hope. This moment where Jesus, the Son of God, the King of the world, is betrayed. It seems to offer little hope. However, if he is sovereign in places like this Passover during this particular year in Jerusalem, if he can manifest glory and accomplish his purposes when to the observer everything seems like defeat and disaster, our history can be no different. Here's the key. If God could transform this hour that we just read about with glory, so too he can transform any hour, including the hour which we're living in today. If this is the God that we believe in, why would we ever take matters into our own hands? Why would we try to attack others when they hurt us or try to control people in situations to protect ourselves? If we believed that, if we believed in this God and King fully, we wouldn't. What's more likely, though, is that these verses are meant to remind us that we don't believe as wholeheartedly as we would like to think. This is true for all of us, I bet, myself included. But take heart, because this very week, you may face moments where you have an opportunity to refuse to take matters into your own hands and instead follow our victorious King Jesus through them. I want to give you an example. I'm going to read this. This is from Ken Sandy. He's one of my favorite writers and speakers, and he shares this story from his own uh, ministry. He has a ministry where he helps disciples grow in their relationships with each other, of learning to love as Jesus loved. So I want to read you this this story from a woman named Susan who shared this with Ken Sandy. This is what it says. It says, this is, by the way, I'm reading this because I think this is what it could look like to trust and obey Jesus and not take matters into our own hands. We're getting practical now. So Susan's boss, Barbara, asked her to make travel arrangements for a trip involving their entire executive team. Unfortunately, Barbara's daughter, so the boss's daughter, Deborah, failed to provide Susan with the information she needed to promptly reserve the airline tickets. When Susan finally secured the seats two days later, they were more expensive and the schedule was less convenient than originally planned. So when the boss, Barbara, learned about the new schedule and costs, she lectured Susan about the importance of fulfilling her responsibilities on time. So pretty unfair given that it wasn't her fault but the boss's daughter's fault that those tickets weren't bought on time. It goes on. As she was being lectured by Barbara, the boss, Susan felt a growing urge to defend herself and to shift the blame onto Deborah, the boss's daughter. Before she opened her mouth, she thought through these these three steps of a plan that Ken Sandy teaches people. The SOG plan. I'll explain that in a second. The S stands for self-awareness. So first thing that that Susan did was that she examined herself. She noticed, oh my gosh, my muscles are tensing up. My heart is pounding. These are sure signs that adrenaline is being triggered by fear and anger. From past experiences, she knew that these emotions could easily hijack her brain. So there's a part of our brains where the, uh, the amygdala where it's like the the emotional part, it moves quicker than the logical part. So there's a gap there. So our emotions could get way out ahead of our thinking. And she knew that if she let that part of her control the situation, that she would regret it later. And I think a lot of us can relate to that um, reality. So here's what she did. Uh, The way that you combat that is you reflect. So a couple of things that she reflected on, and that gives the brain time to catch up. The logical side catches up to the emotional side when you do that, when you reflect. So she reflected on her job security. Her last uh, performance review had been excellent. 
so she reminded herself that she was unlikely to lose her job over this issue. More importantly, as she reflected, and this is super important, so please, make, please pay attention, as she reflected on why do I feel this way? Why do I feel afraid and angry? She identified her biggest obstacle, pride. She hated the thought that Barbara and others would misjudge her and think less of her. But then she recalled a verse she'd once memorized, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Do you know who wrote those words? Peter. Peter learned. So self-awareness. Why do I feel this way? And that gave her time, her emotions, time to catch up with her, the part that we want to control us, right? The part that we want to influence us the most, the word of God. Self-awareness. Then that's the S part of this SOG plan that Ken Sandy teaches. Then there's the O part. So self-awareness and then others' awareness. Susan then focused on Barbara, okay, her boss, who was clearly angry. Her eyes were wide and her voice was sharper and louder than normal. Remembering times when she herself was angry, Susan realized that Barbara's emotions would make it difficult for her to listen objectively to an explanation, especially if it involved criticism of her daughter. Susan recalled a time when another staff member had blamed Barbara in front of her mother, the boss. It had not gone well. Barbara immediately jumped to her daughter's defense and faulted the staff member for the problem. Clearly, blaming Deborah for poor travel arrangements would not help the situation, especially when, when Barbara was just so emotionally stirred up. So that's the O. So there's, there's self-awareness and then there's the awareness of other people. How, how would I affect other people? If I engage into this situation the way that I feel like engaging, it wouldn't go well. So SO, now G is God awareness. Most importantly, Susan turned her thoughts to the Lord and silently prayed, God, please show me how you want me to proceed. A recent sermon on, you guessed it, 1 Peter 2, 21 to 23 came to mind, reminding her how Jesus had left an example by suffering wrong without retaliating and by trusting his father to make things right in his own way. Peter wrote that. So Peter, the, it looks like I can't help myself. Peter, the, the, the guy who impulsively attacked and nearly, if he had had his way, kept Jesus from going to the cross to save us, that same Peter who attacked, realized that you can suffer wrong without retaliating and you can trust in the father's plan to make things right in his own way. You don't think the story that we read today taught Peter that, that moment? It sure did. Not just that, that was certainly a part of how Peter grew and changed. And he was able now to, his, 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 suffer, his mistakes and suffering now teach us 2,000 years later how to handle difficult situations where we feel wrong. Amazing, the redemptive work of God. This is why we can trust him. Going back to this. Susan, she thought about that from Peter. And then she thought of Romans 12, 17, which teaches that when we are being mistreated, we should speak and act so properly that any reasonable person who eventually learns all the facts will acknowledge that what we did was right. Finally, one of her favorite verses came to mind. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. That's Romans 8, 28 to 29. As she reflected on these passages and prayed for humility and grace, she could feel her body relaxing and her emotions subsiding. Seeing that this was not the time to make a defense or to blame Deborah, she simply apologized. Get this, she apologized for the disappointing travel arrangements and promised to be more diligent in the future. As Barbara walked away, the boss, Susan, decided to let things calm down for a day or so, and then consider whether it would be wise to talk privately with Barbara to explain the situation more fully. But someone else beat her to it. A manager who knew all that had happened approached Barbara the next day to explain Deborah's role in the delay. Although Barbara didn't have the humility to apologize to Susan, so the boss didn't say I'm sorry, Susan was relieved when the manager told her that he had clarified the situation and commended Susan for her self-control in a difficult situation. So a situation would have been easy to be impulsive and reactive and to lean and trust in her own understanding and to blame and to attack. She allowed the word of God 
to shape and inform her. She allowed Peter's example and his teaching to inform her. And what happened? She was commended. Instead of having a situation that blew up and that she would later regret, she followed Jesus through this situation and she was commended. By quickly looking at the situation from three perspectives, being self-aware, other-aware, and most importantly, God-aware, okay, S-O-G, Susan avoided a defensive reaction and responded in a way that revealed her trust in the Lord, Psalm 37, 5 to 6, and gave her a positive reputation that could open a door for sharing the source, Jesus, of her relational skills. Amazing stuff can happen when we learn to not take matters into our own hands, react impulsively, but learn how to trust Jesus as we understand his word and his ways, who he is and how he's operated, how he's called us to live. So I want to close with this. I asked a question earlier. When we are wronged, what's often missing in our response? Trust. Trust in God's plan and ways. Like Susan's story illustrated, like Peter's story illustrated in the scripture. We, like Peter, more often prefer to take matters into our own hands. Rather than partnering with Jesus to play a role in his unfolding plan, we come up with our own plan. Set Jesus on the sidelines, often impulsively and unthinkingly, and then execute our plan, which often only makes things worse. The good news, though, is that King Jesus, the betrayed king, he overcame all opposition to crush Satan, sin, and death. We're no longer slaves to sin or to being self-willed or impulsive any more than the Pevensies were no longer, they weren't slaves to the queen, the evil queen, because Aslan defeated her. Okay, even our mistakes like Peter's can be redeemed as we turn to him with fresh trust. Why? He knows what he's doing. And sure enough, in the story of, of Prince Caspian, uh, Aslan, the, the Christ figure, he does show up and he does defeat the enemy and he does restore uh, Prince Caspian to his rightful throne. He did know what he was doing. There was no need for impulsive, rash planning. Aslan knew what he was doing. And there's this, this cool moment where uh, Prince Caspian talks to Aslan. He's like, I don't feel like I'm ready. I don't know that I can do this type of thing. And Aslan tells him, that's how I know that you are. I just want to encourage you. If you feel like the weight of kind of impulsiveness and taking matters into your own hands, the, to the point, that, to the degree that you can say, I can't do this, but Jesus can do this in me, is the degree that you'll find freedom. It's not about you figuring it out. It's about Jesus changing and transforming you and working through you. Hopefully that's good news to you today. So I want to ask you, is there any area of your life where you feel like you've been self-willed and have taken matters into your own hands? Typically, these are the things that we do impulsively and then we regret later. Can I encourage you to bring these things out into the light where Jesus can heal, where he can cleanse, where he can restore you? These words are true. James 5.16, confess your sins to each other and pray for one another so that you may be healed. I have personally done this recently with my gospel community. It felt like there was an area in my life where I had sinned, I'd blown it, and I asked them for prayer. I, I confessed, and things have really turned around. I feel like God has brought healing and joy into that area of my life. Man, if Peter's story can show us anything, is that he's not through with you, not by a long shot. So let's begin trusting him today with your situations, relationships that are difficult and painful. We're gonna head into a time now of worship, and I just wanna encourage you to remember how good this King Jesus is, this betrayed King, who is now enthroned and who has raised us up to heavenly places. And just like the Pevensies, he seated us. We're, we're kings and queens, we're sons and daughters of God, we're royalty. And we get to learn how to operate as royalty by trusting and obeying him. So enjoy him, worship him, delight in him. Miss you, church. Hope you guys enjoy this time of worship. Love you, grace and peace to you.
healing everyone your blood is making all things new your blood speaks a better word your blood the measure of my word your blood oh more than I deserve your Speaks a better word, speaks a better word, oh. singing out with life, shouting down the line, it echoes through the night, the precious blood of Christ, speaks a better word. Speaks a better word. Your blood, robe of righteousness. Your blood, oh, hope and righteousness. Your blood forever covers me. Forever covers me.
runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love. On and on.
Thank you.